For those that have followed the Procession series, you will be familiar with Jim Wenage's concept of our motion as a twisting Birkeland current around Arcturus, and then that the larger structure wraps around the Pallades. This motion is hard to visualize, and many have asked what the supporting evidence for this is. In this video, I would like to take you on a journey to show you what this structure might look like and examine the proper motions of stars around Arcturus that they do indeed support this concept. Let's start by examining how this motion might look like from a variety of perspectives, and this will hopefully help you to understand why some stars process and some do not. First up, let's examine the concept of a nested Birkeland current, or a Bessel function Birkeland current, carrying multiple stars in different shells. In this concept, there would be a star stream running along a central axis. These are colored in blue. For now, we will show this as a straight line, but in reality, this in itself will twist around a larger structure. Wrapped around this would be another helical stream of stars, and these are the white ones. And this would actually be a twisting filament pair in itself. Mapping the white stars to different strands, if it is a twisting filament pair, is a lot harder to do, as there is no central star or central object in the axis. We suspect that Sirius sits on the opposite filament, and this is why you might hear references to the fact that we orbit Sirius, as in a loose sense we orbit around a common center, which then orbits around Arcturus, which in itself orbits around the Pallades. The time it takes for us to complete one rotation of this helical path with Sirius is around 25,000 years. In other words, this is the processional cycle. If we zoom out a little from this twisting pair, then we will start to see it as a single filament. We know that there are stars in front and behind of us on this filament, so let's examine these stars and see if we can map them out. For simplicity's sake, it is not showing the twisting motion these stars would make along their own filament. Further out are what we will now call background stars, and these are the ones in red. From our perspective, they do not move enough for us to be concerned about their motion. The important point to note here is that for each of the white stars, their distance to the central axis will be the same. Clearly, if we pick one star, some may be a little ahead and some may be a little behind, but there is a certain radius that could be deduced if the separation between the furthest and the closest star was not too large. Each of the white stars is moving in a circular orbit around the central star stream and at the same time moving forward in the z-axis. This means that they will appear to move against the background stars, with a variety of motions depending on where they are in their circular path. So what would this motion look like from here on Earth? When we look out at the stars, the first thing you will notice is that the background stars move in an anti-clockwise direction. This motion is a combination of our local filament twisting around, so the one that we are on with Sirius, as well as this double twisting pair twisting around the Arcturus filament. Each rotation around our local filament, as we already discussed, takes around 25,000 years. And each rotation based on our movement around Arcturus would take around 550,000 years. Now these motions are why we think that the Earth wobbles, when in fact it is our motion along this helical path. The 25,000 years maps to our processional cycle. Add in the motion around Arcturus and you can now explain why the value for precession is changing over time. We are not travelling in a straight line. The second point to note is that the stars ahead of us, and also behind us if we look in that direction, do not move at the same rate as the background stars. Our assumption is that the background stars do not move, so what we see is these stars seemingly defying precession and moving against the background stars. These stars would have what they call a higher proper motion. This just means that they are moving against the background stars. It is also important to remember that at the moment this proper motion is assumed to be a linear one, meaning that stars can only travel in straight lines. If we examine this motion, you will see that there are three components to a star's motion, from our perspective. 
its movement across, let's call it x, its movement up and down, let's for now call that y, and lastly whether the star is moving towards or away from us. Let's ignore this last one just for a moment. If we examine the motion of the stars, we would expect the x and the y component of its motion to change as it transcribes a circular path around this helical structure. This means that over time this proper motion would change depending on where it is in this path. When we examine the proper motion for these stars, we do indeed see that they have higher proper motions compared to other stars, and they also appear to have a random direction from where we are looking. If we also examine the central star stream, so the Arcturus one, then we will also notice that this seems to have an additional component to its motion, meaning that these stars should have a higher proper motion compared to other stars. When we examine our nearest stars, we do indeed find that Arcturus has a much higher proper motion compared to any other stars near it. When we examine the motion of the stars towards and away from us, this is called radial velocity, we will see that this velocity is much smaller than, for example, the Arcturus proper motion. And this all seems to be around about 10 kilometers per second. The exceptions are Altair and Russell Haig. If we examine the distance to each of these stars, no overall pattern can be discerned. You could argue that this is all just random and pure coincidence. But if we take one step back, you will see that we can eliminate this random chance fairly easily. If we were able to change our location to the central star in the star stream, so Arcturus, then when we examine the star's motion, what we should see is something completely different. Now using a piece of software called Starry Night, I am able to do just this. Looking at the radial velocities, we see most of these drop to almost zero, with the exception of Russell Haig and Procyon, the proper motion also seems to be fairly similar with a noted exception of Altair. When we examine the distances, something remarkable springs out. They are all around the same 11 to 12 parsecs from Arcturus. So what does this all mean? If we are correct and assume that the motion of our star filament wraps around Arcturus, then we would expect all of these stars to have a very similar radius. We would also expect them to have very little motion towards and away from this central star, and they should have similar motions around this orbit, making their proper motions very similar. And this is exactly what we see. If we pick another random star to perform the same analysis on, you will see that this does not yield the same results. This is not random chance. Further detailed analysis of more stars will start to reveal this structure and the connections to other star filaments. So why do we have some exceptions? Part of the motion that is not as obvious is that each of these stars is part of a pair of filaments that twists around each other. This means that at some points they will appear to be moving away from Arcturus more and sometimes it will appear as if they are moving towards Arcturus. Again, at the moment, this is assuming a simple straight line with a perfect helix wrapped around it. We already suspect that all of these filaments wrap around other larger ones, which in turn wrap around one which is centered on the Pleiades. This means that what we assume as a straight line is not actually a straight line, but actually arcs off in one direction. This could cause variations in the motion that we see. Our assumption that these are perfect helical structures with no variance may also be incorrect, and small changes could account for the discrepancies we see. We are also assuming that the flow of plasma along these filaments is uniform, but this may not in fact be the case. There may be areas where this accelerates and areas where this slows down. This is particularly the case when we examine the Arcturus star stream. It has a much higher proper motion compared to us. But this number is actually hiding what may be a very important clue. All stars orbit around the centre of the galaxy at a fixed speed. Arcturus seems to be orbiting at a slower speed, meaning we are effectively moving away from it faster. When we examine the stars in the Arcturus stream, we find that the majority are red giant stars. These are underpowered stars. Is it possible that the reason Arcturus is moving slower is because it has a lower current flow 
and this in turn causes the stars to become red giants as they struggle to manage their current flow. There is a lot more work that needs to be done to verify this, and to map this further out and look into if it is possible to identify the twisting filament pairs and separate it from the data. So what does this mean our local stars look like? Here we see the central filament, which would be the Arcturus star stream. Now the stars are not this closely packed together in reality, but it's more to help you to visualize this central region and to understand where Arcturus fits in. Now it would sit in about the center of this stream. Right at the bottom, we see Sirius, Altair, and the Sun, and then moving further away, we see Russell Haig, and lastly, Gemma. Now clearly this motion is vastly sped up, and each orbit that we see here represents 550,000 years. Also, this central star stream will actually be twisting itself around the central axis of the Pleiades. Here, each revolution would take around 26 million years. At the same time, the Pleiades stream is moving in an upward direction. As you can see, when you superimpose all of these motions, it can look like a random mess. But by slowly sorting through this data, we can start to see the pattern which reveals our true motion through the heavens. Slowly, Jim Wenig's concept starts to come to life. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.